Yeah, good morning, everyone. So welcome to the second day of the conference. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce the, uh, the keynote speaker of today, Jack Zimmer, who is head uh, at the research group at the DLR, so the, the German uh, equivalent of NASA, who does all the aerospace uh, uh, R&D, and he's also a lecturer at the TU Munich. So welcome, Jack. Thanks, Michael. Uh, for the introduction and uh, also uh, thanks uh, to you uh, thanks uh, uh, for the invitation uh, it gives me the opportunity uh, to maybe have a bit of more time than the usual 20 minutes slot uh, <laughs> that you now have to bear with me and uh, go a little bit deeper in something uh, that concerns me since quite a while. But let's get into the business. When I introduce Modelica to other people, I often use this wind turbine as an example because it shows all the different domains that you can have. Uh, it shows that you have this object orientation and it shows that you can put the equations. Yeah, I don't need to tell you that. Huh? It's preaching to the converted. Yeah. And then, you know, I explain to the people we kind of build a house. Uh, we start with the fundamental laws of physics. We then create idealized components. We then build those together in an object oriented way. We have uh, this multi domain. And then from this on, this is all declarative. We have this one step, our sacred compiler. No matter which compiler you're using, this creates us then uh, something that we can evaluate, use for simulation. And then we can go on and further build the house. Uh, we can then start to do design optimization, control design. We can go into this MBSE topic or whatever buzzword you like to have at the top, uh, the, the rooftop of your house. Um, yeah, with green, I mentioned kind of the application imperative part and the blue part is the knowledge oriented part. So that is how our house uh, is supposed to be. So, well, then let's uh, look at it and we are okay. Take this nice wind turbine model and simulate it. Oh, um, mm. yeah, there is something that went wrong. Hmm. Okay, uh, that's depressing. Let's do something else instead. Here, that's uh, something we like to do at the German Aerospace Center. We model uh, uh, air cycles, that is the climate pack uh, that generates the fresh air. Um, uh, when you're sitting on board of a passenger aircraft, so you take the bleed air off the engine. And uh, since uh, this has a temperature of roughly uh, 250 degrees or 2.5 bar, uh, you should do something uh, uh, with this air before you let it to the passengers, unless you're American Airlines. Um, <laughs> yeah, I have no grief of them. <laughs> uh, OK, so there's this nice thermodynamic process. Ah, uh, you can. There's a wonderful uh, Modelica model you can build for that. If you uh, build it together, you end up with a 200 nonlinear a system of 200 nonlinear equations, and Daimler, for instance, gets it down to 40 iteration variables. So let us simulate that. <sighs> Not again. Uh, okay. Uh, let's give it another try. Here, this is a planar mechanical model of uh, a very uh, simple. Uh, landing gear uh, unfolding uh, dynamics. That shouldn't be so complicated. Look, let's simulate that. Ah, I tricked you. Ah, that, that starts to run. <laughs> so I ah, see it unfold and then reach the point of maximum extension. I even made a video. Let's hope it plays. And then you see at the, at, the, at the beginning, at the end, uh, this is not like how physics works. So yeah, again, here uh, with our blue screen. And yeah, I mean, I had professors approaching me and saying object-oriented modeling does not work. If you look at these examples, you might get the impression that there is some truth to it. And we are now more than 25 years into it. And still, it's, it's a bit depressing because the idea is you can kind of do what you do with a real system. You take uh, your components, uh, like Lego, you, you build it in the actual world, and then you try to run it. Well, it may, if you build the system badly, that it 
works badly, or maybe it works different than intended. But you, I mean, at least in the simulation in that I live, I don't get a blue screen. Maybe I'll get it once and then forever, but uh, um, yeah, it's, it's something uh, that we still have to fight. And I looked at that, we have cracks in our building. And um, this annoyed me um, because I spent huge amounts of time here at the upper levels, or maybe here, trying to fix this stuff. All of the simulation examples that I've shown to you, I got them all running. Yeah, because uh, you attain knowledge, you will start to understand uh, why they are not running. I will go into that uh, and fix these issues. But this is also the reason why you still need quite a high level of expertise uh, to deal with Modelica. Well, you can see this as a business opportunity and say, OK, I'm a consulting company. I can offer this expert knowledge. Uh, you can, as a university, you may say, OK, my grad students have something to do. Um, but I wasn't quite happy with uh, this approach. So I really wanted uh, to look what is it actually that is causing the crack. And the more time I spent, the more deeper I had to go in our building. Because ultimately, um, this has to do with the way we idealize our components, how we idealize physics. Um, so we'll have to look a little bit at that. So when you see what, what people actually do when they set up physical equations. So I bring maybe here some example. You want to model a flow of something through a pipeline thing. So first thing what people typically do is they drop domains. For instance, there might be electric charge. You say, I don't care about that. You say there might be temperature. You say, well, it's not so temperature sensitive. I don't care about that. So you only care about the most basic hydraulics uh, pressure. You drop everything else. Uh, then you reduce the spatial complexity. You may say, OK, I treat that as a, a simple line. Then you isolate the interaction. If you take the basic laws of physics, they basically tell us everything interacts with everything. But we then say, OK, it's OK if the neighboring elements interact with each other, or if I have an electric circuit, those which are wired together. So I isolate the interaction. And then we come a little bit uh, to the, these steps are mostly pretty harmless. Uh, the next two steps are the two critical ones. Often we assume then an instantaneous equilibrium. For instance, we assume what flows in, flows out. That's not necessarily have to be the case, but we can assume that. And often because we make this assumption of an instantaneous equilibrium, we can then take one as a whole. It is important to keep in mind that if you have such a simple law as the one of Hagen Poisson, or you can take any other, all of these idealization steps are implicitly behind this equation. Hardly any textbooks makes the effort to explicitly formulate all these steps. So for good reason, because this textbook would be enormously thick. Uh, no one would read it. Um, but yeah, uh, we'll have to keep that in mind. These uh, processes are always done. And actually, even if you go to non-physical system, you see uh, that people do pretty much the same thing. So here you can take kind of a socio-economic simulation. Then people start uh, to reduce the domains. Uh, all people are equal. Uh, reduce the spatial complexity. Let's ignore geography. Uh, then isolate interactions. We just take groups or companies or organizations, and then uh, we uh, take them one as a whole because within the company we treat everyone this, uh, all the same. So even people from non physical domains basically apply the same tricks. Uh, okay, why do we do that actually? Why do we idealize the systems? Well, the reason is we want to compress reality. I want to have uh, an effective simulation. I want to be fast, and uh, it's not feasible uh, uh, to describe everything. And also, maybe I want to make a robust statement. So if I have a high compression ratio, I have uh, a better hope of deducing something more general. So um, if you take, for instance, video compression as an analogy, you would have the raw video data. 
then you would need to decide where you are willing to do a loss. Yeah, so you study human perception and say, okay, um, if I tolerate errors in this way, the, the human viewer will say that is okay for me. He will not recognize the error that I do with the compression. Then I devise the compression algorithm. I end up with a video file and I have the encoding. So, and the analogy here is simply, I, build, I take my real system and then I have as a modeler, actually the most important thing I have to decide where I'm willing to throw away information. I don't care about these aspects. This is kind of this key central decision of the modeler. Then he starts to idealize based on this assumption, supposing he knows what he's doing. Often this is kind of done implicitly without the people being aware of it. And then you end up with your mathematical model and the simulation would be like playing the video. Um, this idea that you want to compress is um, something old. Yeah, even here, that's always the goal. It is the grand object of all theory to make these irreducible elements as simple and as few in numbers as possible uh, from John von Neumann. Now, um, here that's actually a proper citation in today's world. So uh, today um, uh, we can see it like this. But, um, yeah, physics is, can be seen as a compression algorithm of reality. And then also uh, Chaitin, who is kind of the founder of algorithmic information theory, um, made this remark, which I think uh, has uh, really a lot of truth in it. But simplicity certainly reflects what we mean by understanding. Understanding is compression. So perhaps this is more about the human mind than it is about the universe. And this is something we got to keep in mind. So our, our bandwidth of our conscious thinking is extremely low. We are very, very slow in processing mathematical formulas or uh, uh, information. We can maybe have one thought per second consciously and have maybe a working memory of maybe 12 items that we can keep in mind. It's not much and it's small. I mean, we have a huge powerful subconsciousness, but the conscious part is pretty weak. And so we have, if you want to understand something, we have a high desire for strong <coughs> compression. So, and there is a problem because you can have over compression or in our case, over idealization. And all the examples that I showed do not work because, or did not work because of over idealization. So here in my wind turbine, I have kind of uh, uh, something for the rotor that is called a, a blade element uh, uh, method and momentum theory. So basically you uh, then state there's an equilibrium on the torque that's acting on the blade element and the momentum change of the airflow. And you state you can build up a nice equation for that and hope that you find a solution. The problem is the information how to get to this equilibrium you have thrown away. It's not there anymore. Uh, so it becomes guesswork. Maybe you find the solution, maybe you're not. Depends on your luck. Uh, so actually there's a physical process leading to this equilibrium, but we have discarded that and simply stated the desired end goal. And so I have to rely on the luck of a numerical solver whether I get that or not. Same thing here, I have an equilibrium um, I need to have my compressor uh, or that needs power. I have my turbine that uh, generates power. This should be uh, an equilibrium of power in the cycle. I can simply stipulate that. And again, I have the problem. I have thrown away the information how this equilibrium is actually attained in the physical system. By, for instance, spooling up or spooling down the shaft. Thrown that away. And so I rely on the luck of the numerical solver uh, to get it or not, which may work, but mostly in this system does not. And here with the extension, um, I work with rigid body uh, dynamics. That's already a strong idealization because you won't find a single rigid body in our uh, world. <laughs> Everything is elastic. The point is, I reach the point of maximum extension. I still have kinetic energy, actually quite a lot, and now the kinetic energy has nowhere to go uh, because everything is rigid. I would need something elastic uh, to take the energy. So again, I simply over idealize the system and hence it fails to 
simulate. And this is something very, very common. Because, well, um, uh, it's very, uh, if you work with textbook equations and typically more experienced modelers know that, um, this is typically what you encounter. Uh, you have your real system and then uh, it gets, you, what you find in textbooks is typically over idealized. And that is not a mistake of textbooks. It's their purpose. Their purpose is to provide understanding to us. We have a very low bandwidth of our conscious thinking. So the compression is really, really, really strong. Things get boiled down to a simple formula and hence are over idealized. And the poor guy that has to set up the simulation has now to reverse engineer it and uh, add the relevant physical processes uh, so that in the end uh, we get something that works. Everyone who has done something complex, I think, when un underwent this process. In object-oriented modeling, we make it even worse because we have a further problem. We have to idealize components, um, which is more critical than idealizing a complete system. That's a simple example here of uh, two diodes in series. I want to have them ideally blocking. And then there's the question, what is the voltage split among two uh, ideally blocking diodes? Now, you can say that it's a limit value consideration. So you take the conductance and uh, use this rate here, V1 dash, uh, to go to zero. Well, that's a very boring Lemus function. It ends up with zero. You do that for the other diodes. You have zero. You plug in the whole system together. Uh, you have zero divided by zero, and you have a singular system. Point is, if you first compose and then idealize, you have a regular system. So if you do the Linus value consideration on the total system, you have a regular system and you can use uh, the rule of Bernoulli de l'Hopital and get the voltage drop. Also something uh, you have to be aware of, object orientation is there a little bit more critical. Okay, um, this is all to the understanding of the problem and the key takeaway is actually the following. If you have a problem with over idealization, it's an information problem. You have thrown away the information that you would need to solve the system. No tool can save you from there on. Uh, you can invest in tooling as much as you like, try to make good solvers and whatever. Uh, sometimes I have no solvers that find solutions that are not there. So we, we definitely have good solvers by now. <laughs> um, but yeah. If the information is gone, you cannot retrieve it anymore. And so this point has cannot be solved by tooling. You have to solve it by properly formulating your system in a methodological way. So yeah, how to fix this issue? Um, maybe now I'll, I'll give you, get you into a, a, a um, strange world of view. So I asked myself actually, what do we want to compress? And actually, we want to compress the eigendynamics. Uh, as some of you have noticed, everything on the right plane of the uh, eigenvalue uh, uh, space is uh, the uh, land of mortar, so we don't go there. But now let's assume I have here a system and I have a lot of eigenvalues, and my uh, goal is, of course, to compress this to the most relevant dynamics. And then I start all my idealization processes. I reduce the domains. It doesn't work like, like this, really. Uh, take it as an illustration. Huh? It's, it's not mathematically correct what I show, it's just to illustrate the point. I reduce spatial complexity, so I take away, then I isolate interactions. So there might be like boundary conditions where I say, well, stuff that is so slow, I assume as constant or I uh, stipulate as given. And then again, the evil two processes, assuming an instantaneous equilibrium or assuming an average uh, and taking one as a whole, then takes away everything that is faster or more highly oscillating than a certain threshold. And then I have here the land of nonlinearity that I create uh, by this. And well, um, and hence for, uh, you have also index reduction that may join a few eigenvalues uh, here. And yeah, the point of what to make here is, uh, well, for the white part, we need the differential equations. For the gray part, we need our algebraic equations. So we end up with a differential algebraic equation system. Who might have thought? Huh? Um, 
But unfortunately, we cannot make any solid statement about solving the gray part. That's down to luck. And well, what you could do is try to have a simply different target. I say, OK, everything that is implicit must be linear. So no implicit, no nonlinear equation system in implicit form. What is implicit needs to be linear. And instead, I rather take a kind of replacement dynamics that takes part that takes care of the other part so that I get to the same solution. Now that might uh, sound highly abstract. And how would you want to do that? So let me uh, show you that by what we did with the thermofluids, because this is exactly that. Um, let me speed up a little bit. Uh, so we can start with the Euler equation. OK, so this is simply um, you have here uh, uh, the velocity of uh, the particle. The other thing would be the dynamic pressure. This here is the natural pressure gradient, and the external might represent friction, gravity, whatever you like. Um, <clears throat> we can uh, bring that into uh, uh, integral form for an arbitrary pipe section. So you see, again, I make, I assume, equilibriums, uh, a lot of idealizations already in this step. And then um, I can start uh, to substitute in the first term uh, the velocity with the mass flow. And then uh, I get this nice formula here. And it turns out that I have something like an inertance, which is thankfully only dependent on the geometry of the flow, but not, of the thermo, not on the thermodynamic uh, state. That is very useful. So I can then simply define an inertial pressure that corresponds to the gradient caused by the inertance. And then I have done nothing else than reformulating uh, Euler's equation as a bunch of uh, um, pressure gradients. So inertance, pressure, dynamic pressure, uh, static, and then the external. Everything fine. Then I can uh, define now, I can decompose the pressure and invent the steady mass flow pressure as a complement. The steady mass flow pressure plus R is pressure. It's simply the, defined by the complement. If I uh, plug this in now, then I get uh, uh, basically uh, this formula that the uh, steady mass flow pressure is uh, the external pressure gradient plus Q. And both of them I can express as functions, for instance, of mass flow, density, etc., uh, of the thermodynamic state. OK. Now there is uh, an important question. The question is, uh, is this an elephant uh, eaten by a snake or is this a hat? And uh, what is going on here? Well, this was just a distraction. What I've done, is you have noticed, is I've replaced here the P with the P hat. I cheated a little bit. So there should be P, but I use P hat. Um, Again, this uh, corresponds to the point where I'm willing to do an error. Uh, I'm looking for effective compression. I'm willing to do an error so that I can get to a good form. And this is the exact point where I'm willing to do an error because it really helps. You can, we can do this and use the steady mass flow pressure instead of the pressure because at a steady state or close to a steady state, at steady state, the error is zero. It, that's why it's called steady mass flow pressure. Um, for gases, R is typically very small. Uh, for liquids, uh, the thermodynamic state is mostly insensitive. There are exceptions like cavitations and so on. Many formulas assume steady flow conditions anyway. For, um, you can throw them away in unsteady conditions, actually. Often they're used still, but uh, actually, strictly speaking, one should not. Yeah, and one, yeah, I'll, I'll stop going here more into detail. But you get the point. I'm willing to do an error. And this arrow is extremely useful uh, for the structure of the equation system because now I can start uh, with the thermodynamic state defined by the steady mass flow pressure and simply compute forward, downstream. Everything which is nonlinear is now a downstream computation. 
Also because I can mix uh, the uh, steady mass flow pressure. You cannot mix pressure, but with the steady mass flow pressure, you can do it. That's the nice thing. Um, I, I cannot go into all the details here. Um, and then we end up uh, with equations for the inertance. And if we look at how they are structured for the inertance and the mass flow, I'll go a bit quick, you have to believe now, uh, me is that you have, and this is guaranteed, a simple linear equation system for that. Okay? Actually, it's even better in this case because I've only constant entries in the matrix, so I can actually compute the inverse up front and simply do a matrix vector multiplication. Um, yeah. And this is um, <clears throat> uh, basically uh, what I now can say is everything that is nonlinear can be brought into explicit form, and the remaining implicit part is linear. And then I can make the statement, if I have a robust component model, I will have a robust system model. If my component will compute, my system will compute as well. And this is an incredibly strong and very, very useful statement. And this is what I meant by this. You have to forgive my uh, <laughs> strange worldview here. Um, but yeah, and with this method, uh, it really scales. So this is an example of a Weber cycle having even a bypass and, yeah, and <laughs> a receiver and, um, and some control stuff. And this Weber cycle is then part of such an uh, electric uh, Weber cycle, air cycle compression pack, as you can see here. Um, so that is something you can uh, consider as an alternative to the standard ECS I've shown you uh, before. And this model, is then contained uh, this year, is uh, this year. So, yeah. So, everything you see here is, ah, I'm sorry, there's a delay, um, is contained here. And you have it twice because you have two packs on board of an aircraft. And then you can uh, connect that to a complete cabin model where you have upper floor, underfloor, recirculation, and everything, uh, different compartments for the passengers and then simulate really the complete airflow on board of a passenger aircraft. And then you can make this part of an overall onboard system simulation of a passenger aircraft. And if you look at this now, this has 18,000 equations, 300 states, and it's faster than real time, um, depending on uh, the kind of pack model it is. And here, the robustness really helped. It's not like that we hadn't, didn't have problems with that. We had tons of problems, but at least we had running simulations. So that helped us a lot of figuring out all the control problems, all the other issues that you, that you need to solve uh, when approaching such a task. Okay, yeah. So this is uh, basically how you can say it. Uh, often you find in literature this algebra extreme approach that is also very popular in Modelica where you use mostly algebraic equations, but end up with these high, large linear equation systems, or you find finite volume-like approaches where you have kind of volume, resistance, volume, resistance, and like finite volumes, et cetera, uh, directly ODE form. This year, uh, what we've done here for the stream is in the middle, and uh, something very nice to have. There is then the question, okay, if this works for fluids, can we do something similar for mechanics? There we have kind of rigid multibody, uh, very few states, uh, very efficient. Uh, but I get uh, my nonlinear equation systems as soon as I have kinematic loops. And uh, I have big problems if I have uh, limiting joints or contacts or all these things, or even uh, uh, adhesive friction, uh, all these transients. They cause a lot of problems. And then there are mass spring approaches. Um, where I get a lot of uh, stiffness, a lot of high frequency oscillations, many states, uh, et cetera, you can think about that. So can we find something there? Um, uh, it turns out, yes, you can. So um, this is a bit of a more uh, uh, complex unfolding mechanics, and this now nicely runs. And again, this unfolding dynamics has only a linear equation system of size eight. No nonlinear equation system to compute this. And uh, I can nicely control the eigenvalues 
because I have a replacement dynamics introduced, I can wiggle around a little bit. So I can simulate that with one with a big step uh, with 100 hertz, which is uh, very low. Um, I mean, you have quite a tough impulse here. You do an error, of course, why not? But for many applications, this is acceptable. So that uh, also turns out uh, to be very, yes, some other nice examples. So we were still working on that. That is a bit immature, but it looks very promising, actually. And I was um, a bit flabbergasted when I actually uh, 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 got it uh, to run. Um, the nice thing about these forms is they are hard to retrieve. Uh, it's a big pain for the brain to find these forms. So also with the thermal fluid streams, but once you have found them, they're easy to use. It's not, so if, if someone shows you how that works, it's not difficult. Also with the thermal fluid stream, it's a library that is easy to manipulate and develop your own component. It's just not, they are not evident, these forms. I mean, there's, you don't find the, the pressure decomposition of uh, steady mass low pressure in the inertance in literature. You have to derive it by yourself. This is a bit the, the tough part. Okay, <clears throat> but again, so I will call that dialectic mechanics for reasons uh, I will explain someday later, but this will come. So um, I will want to conclude, I hope I'm not too early. Um, <laughs> Um, but we have more time for discussions and questions. So I think from my point of view, and maybe my view is isolated, and I'm the only one with this opinion, but I think we have a bit misattributed our efforts in the Modelica Association. We had too much focus on language, tools, and computation, and too little focus on modeling, underlying principles, and information. And especially the information point I really need to stress. You need to make sure that in your components, you have all the sufficient information there that you can solve the composed system. And you need some sort of morphology for that. Otherwise, you can't say anything and you're down to luck. OK, I think there is actually a great potential to reduce complexity uh, by following this morphology. It helped us so far. Um, a lot. The more I'm actually getting it, the more potential I see for simplification of this. And also, you have a bit to deviate from classic textbooks. Not because textbooks are wrong, but they have the aim of maximum compression for understanding. But here, we want to have a compression that is suitable for computer simulation. That's a different target. A computer can compute more. You can deal with more equations. We don't have to apply the same compression techniques. We can provide better, more suitable ones. OK, that's almost all what I have to say. Practically, uh, if you want to use the Thermal Fluid Stream approach, it's available for free on GitHub. It's a base library, so we explicitly did not make too complicated components. The idea is you can take it as a starting point and develop your own components. Um, um, so yeah, I think I have to update the tool compatibility, but it works now with Daimola, also with Open Modelica. Meanwhile, almost also better, and I think with model on impact, Hubertus can maybe say something about that. Yeah. We'll do that. And then on the dialectic mechanics, uh, while we're working on it, it's a bit immature now. It looks very promising. Um, so there will be papers coming, and at one point sooner or later in time, there will be also, I think, a public library. Okay, that's all uh, from my side. I hope uh, uh, you enjoyed it a bit at least. <laughs>
seeing all these different modeling approaches at the Modelica conference. And actually, I did not find any conference that is better than that. Yeah, so. If I may answer to that, so indeed, um, for these um, forms that I've derived, you can then apply a limit value consideration, and if you do that, you end up with the original textbook form. So of course, one could uh, provide support for that in the language. It has, however, sunken in my priority list, because I thought, um, when we did this with a the thermal fluid stream, okay, that we have some kind of artificial dynamics into it. And I thought maybe the simulator borders, you know, seeing it in the simulation plot. And we got all kinds of feedback from our users, but that was not the feedback. No, no, they all didn't bother about that. Uh, so um, they were actually quite fine with it. Um, sometimes even thankful for seeing that replacement dynamics. Um, so, I think we should ultimately build a little bit support there, yes. But I have to say the, the uh, further refinement and development of the forms, even with the tools you have, has higher priority for me. Because the people use it even if they're not perfect. Does someone actually want to uh, control which question is picked? <laughs> <laughs> comment to that indeed um, I was perplexed in the sense that I mean Euler's equation is I don't know I think it's from that's at least 100 years old and I didn't thought that you could actually get out of something by reformulating it so uh, I was a bit flabbergasted uh, and, and so far no one I mean I thought I'm not the best in, in reviewing tons of literature so my approach was, okay, let's simply publish it and see if someone complains and say, hey, I've done the same so far. No one has done that. So uh, I'm a bit, uh, and yeah, I, maybe to say since I'm here at the university, um, I'm actually more head of a research team. I'm more with uh, organizational stuff, unfortunately. Uh, uh, 
actually, this is stuff that belongs to the university to question the principles and to find these formulations. And for some reason, the output has been a bit low in, in the past. So maybe, uh, yeah. But, uh, so my 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 affirmation to that it is worth revisiting the fundamentals. Apparently, it is. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so I think that uh, when we think about this set of tools and how we arrive at those equations, uh, at least in the field that I work in, it's very old. Mm -hmm. A lot of those uh, idealizations were made because the computers were not capable of simulating actually anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're, it really requires a change of, uh, it's, it's a change of uh, our paradigm and how we develop models from the ground up to start things without... You know, sometimes we don't even question all those assumptions because the standard modeling approach that's 50 years mm -hmm. old, well, not in our micro so it's 100 years old, shall not be questioned. Mm -hmm. Either if you're in industry or in academia, shall not be questioned. Right? So, I don't know how to deal with that aspect because it's a social aspect of how you actually allow for a degree of freedom and say, no, uh, we have better computers now. If you allow them to solve this, it's a it's quite a complex problem. And I don't know if you have uh, experienced that. And you know, your comment about the university is that like we are not in a old style university system where you actually uh, supported to a useful, uh, useful uh, theoretical development here. We wanted to get grants and pay the teachers. So it's not, don't expect the universities to pick that and then send this up to you guys that actually can uh, open institutes. I want to spend that in the age as well. I will, I, will, uh, I will not comment on the last statement that you made uh, because you are at the, so, uh, but maybe on the, on one side you, I, I may be concerned because I have actually, I'm, I'm not that deep into thermodynamics and now I reformulated thermodynamics and maybe that's the reason why I did it. Yeah, could be, maybe if I would have been deep so, in. So being a little naive is actually based off a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Uh, yeah, I mean, two things here. One is this here is about the data but I think it's also about all these new simulations. Mm -hmm. They expect the solution that they have a problem on the language of the etc. They don't uh, expect themselves to start thinking and um, go the other way and see what the model combination is adequate for solving a particular problem in the emergency field of play. So I think it's much broader than the community. Then in the particular, I think on the political side, you could do a few things better. If you could go to your nice side where you go to the the building mm -hmm. and think you may go I think it can be better and it might be better also. I mean better on a food product, yeah, that's well, that first question. You make mistakes somewhere in your attraction process. The thing is, we as a tool vendor, we see these problems very often. Right? I mean, what about 80% of the support process that comes from the problem at that point? Some of the people belong to the next problem at that point. And I think one of the very first tool vendors and the application side could be a little bit better. In seeing the building in the because for a particular library, let's say from the end, when the point goes wrong at that point, we basically know what the user has done wrong because we have seen it one hundred times. It is difficult to do that in the algorithm view, that is heuristically, you know, we think we see this is the error that we see in eight times, but we think we have seen that that is the error that we see eight times of that's following that. So I think so if there are ways to do that better in terms of these elements, but they are not so different. Mm -hmm. Then in some sense that's that's a band-aid, that the 
the dirt is sort of getting this thing, which gets crap and then finally gets stuck all over it. Yeah, no, I totally agree, but I think you're not because of any kind of language and you can write that whole expression. You're not getting away of that one, and then you're not getting away of, I mean, it's also a model of the root of the model of the And then you get a question that where it's the model of the root of the particular person, which is going to be fine. So I think you will never get away of, of that one. You have to expect all Maybe uh, one, one suggestion from my side is indeed Modelica is a free language and so it gives a lot of freedom uh, to the modeler and uh, I was also very thankful to this freedom when I derived this formula. So I, I, this, uh, deriving these uh, forms without Modelica would have been much harder because I could really try out stuff. Um, uh, however, I think a good way to move forward is maybe uh, to say okay, uh, there's kind of an unsecure modelica where you're allowed to do pretty much everything you like, and then there are maybe certain forms, like if you adhere to this mythology or to this form, um, that is treated more strictly. So one could make a subset maybe, uh, which is, let's say, demanding that the component fulfills certain requirements and is formulated in a certain way. Um, that might be a way to go forward from my point of view to that. So that you could maybe combine the freedom, but also with the rigidity. Also, I have a question actually to the formulation. I mean, now you basically introduce the fast states, which has also its advantages, even though it's a linear OD that's yeah. easy to solve, as you showed here. Earlier, you also introduced the concept of these uh, artificial states, mm -hmm. where you basically add a state variable that's only accurate when the nonlinear solver doesn't converge. Mm -hmm. And then you can basically have a pass to go back to a solution. So all the convergence both applies again. And you haven't mentioned that now in your talk. Is that something that you completely step aside, or is that something that could be built or should be built in into some of the fluid libraries? Because often from the mathematical point of view, with the steady state equations, I mean, we can prove mm -hmm. that the solution exists, that it's unique, but the solver doesn't find it. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the reality after all the proofs. Yeah, it, it uh, uh, corresponds to the uh, to what I said to Michael is yes, we could uh, still do this and find a way to. In the end, what I did with these artificial states is to treat them as a limit value consideration and then uh, maybe make them part of the nonlinear solver. Um, so um, I thought uh, in two ways a little bit about it. Um, First of all, it has simply sunken in priority, as I said before, because I got the feedback from the users, we don't care about the artificial dynamics that we see. Uh, that was simply the feedback. Uh, the other thing is, um, it would be very attractive to do, um, but in combination with index reduction, it's actually pretty tricky if you really think about it. I think that's actually really an interesting mathematical field. Uh, there's like singular perturbation theory in it, and it's highly related to that. Uh, so if there is uh, some applied mathematician who feels motivated into that, I'm glad to support. Uh, that could be really done something really quite nice. Um, for the moment, again, for me is keeping it simple, uh, my priority, but that would be something really interesting for a mathematician. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for having me.